Well, thank you all for coming this afternoon. Apparently, we had some pretty stiff competition with the Seahawks game, so we were, we were pleased that we filled, filled the seats. Um, I would uh, like to talk to you kind of about the conception of this project and um, the details behind it. Again, this is my colleague Maria Coriel Martin. Mm -hmm. We're going to give kind of an unconventional presentation where we're actually going to be to be splitting our time up here. So I'll talk largely about the science, about um, the reasons for us working in the Arctic, kind of what, what we're studying up there. And Maria will give to you a slightly different twist on things, what an artist might see when she goes into the field with a scientist and how she could capture both what we're doing and the environment where we're working. So um, just a little background on me. I, um, I'm a biologist and I work at the University of Washington and my work has largely been focused in the Arctic for about 15 years. Um, I study a number of different species up here in the in the top left, uh, you see a bowhead whale. Um, down here, I'm working on polar bears, doing some dental work. Um, we do a lot of observations uh, from land and sea. And up in the top, uh, top right shows that we work closely with uh, local hunters, Inuit hunters, uh, in all the communities where we do projects. So in the Arctic, there are seven marine mammal species, and these marine, marine mammal species are called the true Arctic marine mammals in that they basically spend most of their lives above the Arctic Circle, and they're very closely associated with sea ice. So there are three species of whales, or cetaceans, and from uh, the top left down, you see the bowhead whale, the beluga whale, also known as the white whale, or the narwhal. And then there are three species of pinnipeds, or seals, the ring seal, the bearded seal, and the walrus, and then of course the Arctic's icon, the polar bear. And all of these species inhabit the circumpolar region you see here uh, where the, the ice is kind of pink red color and the ocean is shown in blue. So um, some might ask, well, why, why as a scientist would you be interested in studying the Arctic? And maybe these days that's not very difficult to answer because it's all over the news. Um, or why won't you study the animals that live in the Arctic? So um, any of you have, who have been tuned into your TVs or your radios or your local newspapers or magazines might have seen that there are a number of things coming out that uh, make you concerned or maybe just make you interested, suggesting large changes in the Arctic. And so any scientists that are working in an area where we see large changes think that's really exciting because documenting those changes and understanding those changes is, is um, you know, really a reason to, to do some work. There have been extreme changes in the Arctic. So uh, starting in 1979, we were recording sea ice extent from uh, satellites orbiting the Earth. And in 2012, we had the lowest, uh, the lowest record extent of sea ice on record since the beginning of those satellites. And it's a little bit difficult to see here, but there's a yellow line on the bottom graph, and you could see that's where the ice, the mean ice used to be, and then the white is where the ice currently is. So other reasons to study the Arctic, this is a photo from Greenland, and these are glaciers, and um, a big issue is, of course, sea level rise. So as we have a warming climate, as we have things melting, the oceans are rising, and that has a big effect on our coastlines and our, our coastal cities and communities. Uh, other reasons to study the Arctic. So as the Arctic warms and melts, humans are interested in going up there. And so we see a lot of new human impacts. This map shows you the, the famed Northwest Passage, and that's basically a shipping route that shortens the, the, the current shipping route by about half and saves people a lot of money to send ships through the Canadian Arctic and around the north coast of Alaska. Um, increases in shipping also are coming with increases in exploration, so seismic exploration, uh, offshore drilling in the Arctic, uh, increases just in general in shipping materials around that have impacts on animals that live there. Um, another reason, the Arctic is what we call a bioaccumulation site for pollutants. So pollutants from many places in the world actually end up in the Arctic and end up in the tissues of, of these animals. And the way it works is, is, is these, um, these pollutants kind of compound themselves. They get magnified the higher you go up into the food chain. So when you're working on some of these top predators like the polar bear, you actually see very, very high level of 
pollution that doesn't necessarily come from the Arctic but comes from elsewhere. And we also know that that pollution not only ends in those top predators, but in the Arctic and humans who consume many of those species for uh, subsistence. Also in the Arctic, there's a very interesting management um, role where we have humans and an interesting culture and we have wildlife that need to be managed. Um, so there's a lot of kind of interesting dynamics between people and animals and the environment. So I want to briefly give you an introduction uh, to Greenland. So Greenland is the site where um, I had an ongoing narwhal study and in 2013, created this collaboration with Maria where she came to um, my study site and we worked together to create this project. And so I want to give you a little bit of background on Greenland as a country and, and what people do there. Um, Greenland in Greenlandic is called Kalaslit Nunat, which means the people's land. Um, but Greenland isn't really for people because for the most part Greenland is ice. About 80% of Greenland is covered with ice. And the ice cap is over 1,500 miles long and uh, over 600 miles wide and about 9,000 feet thick. So the ice ultimately does end when you get near the coast. And so the coastline are the sites of Greenland where people can actually have uh, villages and towns and, and live because uh, there's some, some exposed land. And I'm just going to show you a few photos of what that looks like. Again, this is the ice cap. No people up here. So there are about 60,000 people in living in Greenland. Um, about 85% of those people are, are Greenlandic or Inuit. And then there are a number of uh, people from Scandinavian countries also living there. Let's see. So um, Greenland is a, is a culture where it's subsistence hunting, or basically hunting and fishing and living off the land is still a very important part of the culture and uh, people's lives. They get a lot of resources from the sea and the land. Uh, they use a lot of traditional methods, like for example, um, hunting from kayaks, the traditional Greenlandic kayak shown here, which they make themselves. They also use traditional modes of transportation like dog sledge, so this is a a polar bear hunter out on the ice and they'll take trips for three weeks at a time going out onto the sea ice to, to hunt for bears or other animals. The capital of Greenland is called Nuuk and that's about 15,000 people and that's the center of the government activities. Um, the parliament, they have their own parliament and uh, do a lot of, a lot of their, their basing, uh, the government activities there. Um, so Greenland is, is, is split up into towns. Those towns are, are anywhere from about 1,000 people to 10,000 people. And they're serviced by cargo ships several times a year. Uh, and sometimes it's serviced by airplanes if there's a, a landing strip. This is just a photo that shows you the town of Apernovik. So this is at 73 degrees north, so well above the Arctic Circle. It's a town of about 1,000 people, and you can see they actually blew off the top of the mountain there to create that landing strip, that runway, so that you can land a plane and, and bring supplies in. So most of Greenland, you, you can't land a plane. It's very rugged. And there are settlements in Greenland. So these are smaller communities that are anywhere from about 60 to 600 people. They're serviced by a helicopter, so they'll bring, a helicopter will bring in supplies once or twice a week, and occasionally it will be a boat. And these are just some photos of some settlements. This is called Kuslarswak. Um, with 430 people. And this is a photo by actually a, a photographer that's in this vanishing ice uh, exhibition called Tina Itkonen from Finland. This is a settlement called Savisivik. It's at 76 degrees north. It's one of the most northern settlements in Greenland with about 66 people. And this is a settlement called Niaronet. And this is located above the Arctic Circle at 71 degrees north. It has 59 people. And this is the base for our operations for this project. So it didn't look quite as warm and inviting when we worked there, but it looked something more like this, frozen in, um, still bright and sunny, but, but a little bit colder. So um, with that, I will pass the baton to Maria, who will give you some background on the art side of this. Thank you, and uh, I'm really happy to be here and part of this uh, wonderful exhibit and series. And to have the opportunity to share with you a contemporary expeditionary artist in some ways I'm a little old-fashioned, still going out with a sketchbook. And before I go into some of the background of how I ended up out here sketching on the sea ice with Kristen and developing our project together, I'd like to give you 
just a little background on expeditionary art. As Chris mentioned, it really began as a concept with Captain Cook's voyages, where the artist, the expeditionary art, was a fusion of cartography, of art, and science as a means to record and explore. No photography, sketchbooks were, were really the way to capture these regions. And this is a piece by the onboard naturalist artist William Hodges that is part of the Vanishing Ice show, which is one of the earliest renditions of an iceberg drawn from nature here, William Hodges. So an early example of expeditionary art. One of my other big inspirations as well is Edward Wilson. And Edward Wilson uh, traveled down to Antarctica with um, the expeditions on the Discovery and the Terra Nova with Robert Scott. Unfortunately, they all perished down there about a hundred years ago, but before that unfortunate event, he was on board as the doctor, as the ornithologist, and as the artist. And what I want you to take away from that is the expeditionary artist could wear some different hats. The hat of, an, of a scientist, the hat of an artist. He was also really useful. And so, in going out, I've taken Edward Wilson as one inspiration to bring together multiple perspectives. If we can approach a landscape or an environment from the perspective of a scientist, from the perspective of an artist, we can understand and appreciate it more. So Edward Wilson. So through my own work, I've been bringing together my interest in art, science, and education to travel and paint around the world, to try again, to bring together these perspectives and to tell stories. And I love remote regions where you go out, whether in Alaska or Greenland or Antarctica, and everything in these regions are really highly specialized to exist there. It may look like a stark, empty landscape, but these remote places, such as Greenland, are so highly specialized and evolved. And then when we have things like climate change, they're threatening the system that's in balance. And these stories really interest me and have inspired much of my work and the inspiration to work with Kristen. So Chris mentioned in my introduction, our introduction, uh, the Watson Fellowship, which really launched my career as an artist. I went to Carleton College. I've always loved to paint. It's been a means of personal expression, interpreting the world. But the Thomas J. Watson Fellowship gave me the opportunity to paint for a year, exploring different remote regions. And in planning out the voyage, which began in French Polynesia, went to Tibet, onto Mali, West Africa, and finally up to Greenland, I uh, was introduced to Kristen Lydra by my father. And he said, hey, I think you two would like each other. You should meet. And I'd been planning to go to Baffin Island. And Kristen is very persuasive. And she said, no, 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 no. Don't go to Baffin Island. Come to Greenland. And you can maybe meet up with me, or at least you can come stay in my place. And so she saved my life, essentially, as I crashed for five days in between spending time in West Africa to the Arctic. And I spent seven weeks in Greenland, or goodness, actually I'm closer to three months, exploring these different landscapes that Green, uh, Kristen has described. So in the upper left-hand corner is a sketch from Summit Station, which is in the very middle of the Greenland ice cap. I also was able to meet out sketching with my uh, materials, diamond prospective geologists. So that bottom sketch is actually, uh, they have a drill that they've, uh, slung out with the helicopter to the middle of the mountains and let me come along and sketch and see the, the uh, minerals they were extracting to look for diamonds. So I got a perspective on the mineral extraction in Greenland. And finally, my time there finished with a seven-week residency at Upernivik, that small town, which is the one where the mountaintop was blown off. And while at Upernivik, I watched the sea ice with a spring thaw as it began to break up and float away and change on the wind and the currents and the, the spring heat. And this ever-changing environment really captivated me. It's really ephemeral, this ice and the water, the light, the colors, the textures. And I was hooked. I knew I had to go back. And so since then, I did many projects around in the North Cascades, Antarctica, but Greenland really stayed near and dear. And Kristen and I have stayed in touch over the years constantly wondering, well, how can we work together? Wouldn't it be fun to do a field project together and create this project? So we came up with the idea in 2011 and received funding from the Vettelson Foundation in New York for me to join Kristen in the field to help develop a collection of stories through field sketches, 
some audio, my writing, to help uh, share and illuminate this landscape through, through art. So why not just take photographs? Well, I think sketches have this personal human element. And when I sketch, I also feel like it transforms me from a passive observer just walking by to really an active observer of paying attention to every detail, looking at something that much more closely. And I, in an education side of my work, love sharing these tools for observation with other people. So this is my primary sketchbook, the Art Toolkit, that I use when I'm in the field. And I offer a version on my website, too, if you're interested in, in exploring it yourself, or you can look at this example on the table after uh, our presentation. Sometimes it's really cold. Watercolors have a hard time in the cold. And so I have a trick. I add vodka to my water brushes uh, to help lower the freezing temperature. And uh, people have said, well, why not just rubbing alcohol? Sometimes you need a little for emergencies. It's better to have something just in case. And outside, I think about building my palette of place, this vocabulary of color, climate, colors, might be studies. And this is one example of how I work. If it's so cold that my color trick doesn't work as well, I might do the, the color studies separate and use pencil sketches that then in the field or in the studio, I can trace and then paint and return to and paint again. So here's the final one that I completed back home after those other studies. And this is Niaornet, that snow-covered town that Kristen showed you. And I want to just take a moment to share with you a few uh, sketches from it and try and put you in the environment. are a big part of Greenland and depending on the time of year it can be more interesting to be a sled dog winter versus summer and spring can be iffy uh, only sled dogs are allowed above the Arctic Circle which is an interesting side note too but uh, in the hour night it turned out to be an early spring while we were there and I thought I'd just show you a little time in the life of a sled dog these are working animals they're not pets they're bred for their their endurance and their uh, their strength and putting up with this cold. And so they're tied up year round unless they get to go run around on the ice. So these ones you see, life's not as interesting when there's not much ice. And so last spring we were in the hour net and the snow was beginning to melt. Kristen told me it was an unusual year for her, which she'll tell you more later. So some other perspectives of the town. And when there's no ice, fishing is still one endeavor that's really an active part of village life. As Kristen mentioned, there's a uh, lot of subsistence living. And so uh, from cod and halibut, you see fish drawing everywhere. And one night, we were working in this tiny house, much like the houses you've just seen. And I got a knock on the door, and this sweet hunter brought over this big Atlantic cod, about 30 inches wide. And so that was a painting I completed of it before it got too, uh, before too long, and then we ate it for dinner. So that's one of the perks of being an artist, when you can eat your materials, or your inspiration, rather. And this is a look at some of the sea ice out in front of that, uh, in the fjord, outside of Niaornet. So I'm just going to let this set the scene for a moment, and then Kristen's going to talk a little bit about what her research has done out there. Um, so some of you might ask, well, what are you doing there? 
So I'm going to try to give you a little background on what, what we're doing. Um, so this, the species of interest uh, that, that, that was part of the, kind of the focus of the project is called the narwhal. And the narwhal is a medium-sized tooth whale that lives in the Arctic. They are famous for their tusk, and you can see that in this excellent photo by Paul Nicklin. The tusk is actually a tooth that grows out of their top upper left jaw. And the tusk only grows in males. Very rarely a female will have a tusk, but for the most part, if a narwhal has a tusk, it's a male. Um, the word narwhal, so the prefix nar comes from Old Norse, and it means corpse. And so the narwhal is the corpse whale, and it got that unfortunate name from the fact that it has this kind of mottled black and white skin coloration that unfortunately resembles that of a drowned person. Um, their Latin name is monodon monoceros, and that means one tooth, one horn. And so that, of course, refers to the fact that they have, they have the tusk. So narwhal tusks uh, are, are famous because they go back for many, many centuries. They were sold as unicorn horns by the Vikings to the Europeans, and the Vikings made a lot of good money on this secret because nobody went to Greenland to actually verify that they came from unicorns or something else. So the unicorn was a um, kind of a, an important part of culture and uh, society for, for many hundreds of years. And actually, really, um, when you look through history and you look at in art and poetry and um, medicine and, and, and writing, I mean, it, it, the unicorn appears in a number of different places. And so I just put uh, a couple of examples up here, different pieces of art. A uh, unicorn shows up in the... In the Bible, the, the royal unicorn throne of Denmark is a very famous piece of furniture. I, well, it's one of the, what I consider a famous piece of furniture because the king had himself made a throne completely out of narwhal tusks. I don't have a laser pointer, but you can see every single one of those vertical pieces are a piece of a narwhal tusk. So you can imagine sitting on a unicorn throne, you would probably be pretty special. Um, the unicorn tapestries, of course, are another, another example of that. So, so what happened, the poor Vikings, in 1638, along comes a guy named Ole Worm, and he wrote his dissertation on the narwhal, and he proposed in front of the merchants of Copenhagen that unicorns may well be myth, whereas narwhals are fact. And that was kind of the beginning of the end for the idea that these tusks came from the unicorn. Um, he was actually kind of a crazy guy. He did a lot of experiments grinding up narwhal tusks and feeding them to his own pets to see what happened to his pets and he, you know, nothing happened to the pets so he concluded they weren't magic after all. <laughs> so, um, of course, the interest in narwhal tusks has continued um, since, since the 1600s and um, at the moment the, the trade in tusks is regulated and controlled by um, large international uh, organizations that, that are kind of monitoring those kinds of things, but uh, certainly it, it, it still inspires myth around the world, without a doubt. So the, the question I get universally every time I give a talk is what is that thing really for? Because it's pretty strange to have the, something like a tooth growing out of your, your head and, and swimming around with it. So um, let's try to solve that mystery. So the first question is, well, do they use it for spearing fish? And this is a great photo by uh, a National Geographic photographer, Paul Nicklin, who got a narwhal, actually who had by accident speared a fish at the end of its tusk. And um, I don't think this has a laser pointer, but the, the mouth of the narwhal is down close to the water line there. So you can imagine if you have your dinner hanging out six feet in front of your mouth, that wouldn't be particularly convenient. So it's definitely not for spearing fish. So then some people say, well, do they use it to kind of saw holes in the ice? Um, they, they, they don't because narwhals are, are not really able to break much ice. You can see from this photo I took standing out on the pack ice, these kind of hummocks or humps in the ice are from where narwhals are able to push up with their dorsal area and kind of break the ice, but they can only do that when the ice is very thin. And sawing a hole with your tusk is not practical because you would most certainly break it. And they do have some broken tusks. So then people say, well, do they sword fight with them? Um, and the answer is, is no, they don't. When you see, when you observe males interacting with their tusks, you see them moving actually very gently. It's almost like some kind of ballet. They're, they're, they're not violent. Um, they, they cross them and kind of rub their tusks together and go underwater. And um, very often when you observe that, there is a female nearby. So 
that might give you a hint about what it's for. This is a nice photo because it shows a very young narwhal. So narwhals aren't, fortunately for the females, not born with tusks. Um, and they uh, grow the tusks after they're about um, one and a half, two years old. They, they kind of, the tooth erupts and it starts to grow. So you can see what a very young, young male looks like there. So they're not for sword fighting. Um, a long time ago, a guy named Charles Darwin spent a lot of time thinking about the narwhal tusk, and I, I'm not going to read you this quote, but basically he contemplated, well, when males possess weapons or, or decorations or horns that, that, that females don't, what would you think it's for? Well, of course, he concluded this has some kind of what we call in biology sexual selection component. So essentially, the narwhal tusk is analogous to what you might observe as the mane of the lion or the feathers of a, pe a male peacock parading around for the females, antlers on a stag, or uh, the mandrill, which is the most colorful mammal in the world, and the males have these amazing faces that, that are used to basically compete with other males or, or, or establish dominance and attract females. So that's the answer to that question. I just wanted to point out, very rarely you will get a double tusk narwhal. They're very, very rare. Um, yeah, only few have been caught. This is a, a friend of mine who's a hunter in North Greenland, and he's one of the few, few hunters that have ever caught one. And you can see that, that this is the case where two teeth erupt. And so basically, the, there's an embedded tooth in the right side, and they both erupt, and you get a, a narwhal with, with two tusks. That's a very rare, rare thing. So narwhals are extremely interesting. Uh, I think, personally, very interesting animals. They, uh, they're one of the most extreme divers in the, the whale kingdom. They, um, they dive down to more than a mile below the sea surface, in some cases 15 to 20 times per day in very dense ice in winter. So this is, this is pretty extreme behavior. And what they do, they're, they're diving down to the bottom of these Arctic areas and they're largely feeding on flatfish or the Greenland halibut, which you can kind of see uh, this brown, not very attractive fish there in the corner. And the Greenland halibut, they're kind of interesting. They, um, they're not a true flatfish in that they're, they're, you know, flatfish, the eye migrates over, so you have two eyes on one side of your head. Well, these fish actually end up, their eye gets stuck on the top of their head, so they can swim around in the water column with one eye here and one eye here. So it's kind of neat. So this is just an illustration um, of how, how deep these dives really are. And so those of you who have seen the Space Needle in Seattle, know that the Space Needle is about 600 feet. And so one of these dives, which takes a narwhal about 30 minutes round trip, will be approximately um, eight Space Needles piled on top of each other or about a mile below the sea surface. So narwhals are tooth whales. You know that this tusk is a tooth. But what's very interesting is when you look in their mouth, they actually have no teeth at all. So they're all gums, except for the big tooth growing out of their head, and you can see that, that illustrated here. And that means that when they catch these fish, what they do is basically swallow them whole. And if you've ever looked inside a narwhal stomach, which I, I can't recommend, but if you have, um, you might find something that looks like this, just giant whole halibut that are about this big, and they can pack their stomach full of 15 to 20 of these fish, probably on a single dive before they come to the surface. So. So we have done uh, studies of narwhals for, uh, even before my time, um, colleagues have been studying narwhals for several decades and trying to understand how these whales move around and, and, and sort of what they do in the Arctic. And what we know from a number of studies, don't make too much, don't worry too much about this map other than the different colors are actually different subpopulations of narwhals. So narwhals live in these separate subpopulations and they migrate. So they migrate from high Arctic areas in summer and they move offshore out into kind of that area where you see all those squiggly lines overlapping each other. So what we're doing in this project is we're actually working in wintertime in the area called Baffin Bay offshore where narwhals have migrated to and are spending the winter. So this is just a picture of where we're located on the coast of Greenland in uh, just just outside of the Umanok Fjord in the small settlement called Niaronet. And I just want to show you a time series of the, um, the, the previous three winters. And this is, a, this is a little bit hard to see if you're not used to looking at satellite images, but basically you're looking at what the ice conditions are. And so this is 2010. This is 2011. This is 2012, if it changed. No, that's 2012. 
and that's 2013. So if you notice one thing about that time series, you might notice that there's actually quite a bit of open water. And so when Maria joined me on the study, I, you know, we had it all planned out and the ice would be close and it would be pretty convenient. And then we got there and as far as we could see, it was the open ocean. So we had to modify some of our, our work because of that, but um, this is largely what the conditions were at the time. So basically a typical day uh, when, you're, when you're in the field and you're working on the ice, you wake up, you look out the window and decide if you can even see anything, if you can fly. Um, then if you have internet, you get, it, you get online and you can look at the current sea ice conditions. So you can get a feel for how the ice has moved. The ice is constantly moving. So every day the ice will be arranged in a different way. It'll have blown in or moved out. So you get a feel for how far you have to fly over open water to get out to the ice. And then um, if you decide to fly, you kind of start with a series of events. And Maria, in, in, in her collection of imagery and, and movies, has put together something here, uh, a movie that I hope plays, which has some audio, and you'll get a feel for what we do. And I'll try to talk, talk you through it. So the n number one most important thing is that you have enough fuel. And we have placed fuel depots over a year in advance in strategic places around the Arctic, that, um, in the, the Arctic area where we're working, that we use to fuel the helicopter. And then we, of course, go out and, and, and kind of take the covers off our helicopter and warm it up and fuel it up and make sure that it's ready to go. And then we start the packing, and that requires carrying a lot of equipment in, into the helicopter and finding a, um, finding a place for it and packing the whole thing up. So here is just a time series of showing us doing a lot of walking back and forth carrying boxes. Sped up, of course. So this is our preparation before we, uh, we go out on the ice. So we take off. Now we're leaving the town. And you can see all the open water we had that year. So we're flying over a lot of open water. That's sometimes strange angles if you get seasick. And we're flying offshore. So you can see this is very poor ice. This is very thin ice. You don't want to land a helicopter on that. You don't even want to walk on that. So we have to fly over all of this very thin ice to get out to ice where we might actually A, find whales, and B, be able to work. And you'll slowly see that come. It's about 75 uh, miles offshore. So this is, this is the ice we want. So once we get out to this ice, we start looking in these things called leads, leads and cracks. So they're basically thin openings where the ice has separated, and that's where the narwhals are located. They, they spend time in these leads and cracks between their dives. So we fly along until we spot a narwhal, or two, or hopefully more than that. And then we put the helicopter down. So um, one thing to know about narwhals is they're probably one of the most skittish uh, whales you could study. And so when you're trying to sneak up on a narwhal with a helicopter, it's, it's, it's not the smartest thing. But it's basically the only way to get out to where they are. So often when you see whales in a lead, you put the helicopter down and all the narwhals dive immediately and disappear. And what you basically can do is hope that they come back. Sometimes they come back and sometimes they don't. Uh, when they come back, uh, you might see something like this. So you might wait about 20 minutes, that's kind of their, their typical dive cycle. They come back up and they take a breath and then you know, okay, I'm down, I'm in good weather, I'm on safe ice, and I'm able to start doing something. So what it entails for our project here, we have two, two pieces of the project and I have two small clips where my, my colleagues are going to tell you about it. But essentially we're, we're studying the acoustics of this animal. So we're collecting data on what kinds of sounds these whales make under the ice, how they use sound to navigate, to find food. And all of that has kind of balled into the fact that we expect there to be more noise, more underwater noise in the Arctic as the ice breaks up and melts and as we have more shipping and more activity. So we're kind of collecting baseline data on acoustics, and we're also putting transmitters on these whales. And what we do is we, we shoot small tags into them that allow us to track their movements and their diving for several months at a time. So we'll drag our equipment very silently out to the edge. I can tell you the narwhals, as soon as you start walking, they know you're there and they dive. So you usually have to wait for another 20 minutes when they come back after that. 
and uh, attempt to sneak up on them wearing white, because white is a good disguise for a narwhal. And I'll, I'll let my colleague um, Jens Koblitz from Germany tell you a little bit about our acoustics project, and this will have an audio component. So I'm Jens Koblitz from the German Oceanographic Museum in Stralsund, northern Germany. I've been very glad to be part of this project here and recording our words and belugas with a 16 hydrophone array system. One of us is walking ahead with a probing stick and kind of checks on the quality of the ice if it doesn't break. And then we set up the recording equipment right at the edge. We just throw the 16 hydrophones in, 90 meters of cable, um, and fire up the computer, connect all batteries, check if everything is working, and then quickly close the laptop again. Okay. Yeah, go for it. And then we basically just either sit out there and, and wait and observe and see if we see way of surfacing, or if it's really, really nasty and cold, we walk back to the helicopter to sit inside and be at least sheltered a bit. So, um, so that's what you might hear when you drop a hydrophone under the water in the Arctic. Um, you hear a lot of kind of sad whistling in the background, basically constant whistling. So those are not narwhals. Those are actually a species called the bearded seal. And they're sort of famous for making a lot of noise all the time. And the males make these kind of whistling songs as they dive down and try to defend their territories and attract females. The kind of squeaky weird chirps that you heard in between the sad whistling, those were the narwhals. They're maybe not as exciting as the bearded seals, but so you're, you're listening to a mix of species in that clip. So um, while we're out on the ice, we also have to constantly look around because we're not the only ones on the ice, of course. There are other um, critters that are interested in you, particularly uh, the polar bear. So often you'll land at a site that looks really good. Sometimes you'll see a bear before you land because the bear is interested in hunting narwhals just like you. Or sometimes you'll have footprints straight up to where you're working and just try not to be too distracted by that. Um, but most certainly we see these bears out on the ice and, and when you're working there that's a pretty big safety, safety concern so we're, we're constantly, constantly aware and, and searching for them. Um, and so here I just want my colleague Miggle from Denmark to tell you a little bit about our tagging project. He is a designer who has built some very interesting equipment that enables us to put tags on whales, and that's not an easy thing to do. So I'll start this here. I'm, uh, I'm Mikkel Willem Jensen, and uh, I'm from Denmark, and I am the technician. Uh, I have a, a special gun that can shoot at a distance of not more than 10 meters. It can shoot longer, but I need to be precise, and there's not much time uh, when the whale surfaces until it dives again. So we need to have them very, very close. And we have learned that they do get close to the ice age, but it's just about being there at the right place at the right time. Okay. So I'll pass to Maria. So my role in the field has been a lot of storytelling, documenting the process of science, the landscape, putting together some of these stories that Kristen just showed you with her colleagues to help illustrate what's going on out here. And on the practical side, that's a lot of sitting around, trying to keep my fingers warm, and paying attention to the events. And I, in some ways, I like to think of myself, I get to be an extra observer, observing the scientists, observing the animals. And so here's Mikkel out watching for narwhals in his disguise. These are ink watercolor sketches, five by seven. Again, that small art toolkit. And watching whales pop up. I was sketching in the field, I think first about capturing the, those big shapes, big ideas of what I see, and then honing in that palette of place, developing the colors, the textures, to find that landscape. Scientists setting up equipment out on the ice. It's a rough environment to be in. Fortunately, when we'd go out, there'd be typically 
brilliant weather, because we'd need the brilliant weather to actually find the narwhals, but it could be blowing uh, high winds or the below freezing temperatures, listening for narwhals, dealing with the equipment. And the tools scientists use really interest me as well for another component of the story. I think it's one thing to read stories in the newspaper or um, scientific lectures with just the data presented, but I get curious at the process, as Kristen's described, the process of the field science. How does it happen? And the tools are a big part of that process. And these are two sketches of the different hydrophones uh, that she and her colleagues were using out in the field. One single hydrophone on the uh, left-hand side and the other that complete array. Thinking about more tools, the helicopter. I love that little Air Greenland helicopter. It's so cute. And uh, whether sketching inside it or outside it, the helicopter was one place we could potentially go for shelter. And here's some sketches completed. Oh, this is out on the ice, rather, looking um, just to put you in that environment a little more. This is 45 minutes a panorama time lapse. That sparkling light and the wind blowing. And right now we're all hoping narwhals come back. So sitting very quietly, trying not to disturb them on the ice. I think a lot about expeditionary ethics when I'm in the field and on an expedition. As I mentioned with Edward Wilson, he would wear a lot of hats as an ornithologist, as a doctor, as an artist. And you're, you're often in a field, you need to look for things that need to get done and help out with them. And so for me, that meant doing my own work as an artist. And then also being generally useful in uh, participating and schlepping that heavy gear. And uh, we all get tired and need little breaks sometimes. So this is running back to the helicopter and staying warm. And I want to show you just a little bit of the humor side of, of some of our time in the field, hearing what life is like in the helicopter. We're at 71 degrees north, 58 degrees west, out in the middle of Baffin Bay, sitting with four people in a helicopter on the sea ice, eating <laughs> pretty much frozen liver pate sandwiches. And with, drinking with tea. Pesto and cheese with on pesto it. and cheese, which we don't recommend except for Norwegians. <laughs> and what are we yeah. rocking out to? <laughs> well, there's some bad music on the iPod from Norway. But, <laughs> <laughs> but beggars can't be choosers when you're at 71 degrees <laughs> north. You take whatever you can get. <laughs> So a little, a little clip of, of life in the field. And I think one thing that I really came away with from getting to participate with this expedition is the immense amount of effort and the degree of luck that was necessary for everything to get pulled off. As Kristen showed, waiting for the weather, waiting for the, having the fuel, actually finding these animals, and having an international team of participants too, it made me appreciate the data that comes out of science in seeing some numbers or seeing a map and then thinking about whether the, the hundreds of hours flown in a helicopter or the, um, the millions of dollars that may be spent on equipment and travel and trying to find these animals, the process of science. And I think um, in helping encourage our, our ongoing uh, commitment to supporting science in these regions. Here's an aerial sketch of those ice leads completed in the helicopter. And so these field sketches for me are, are really the beginning of what I'll be finishing um, for this project. They're going to be inspiration for studio paintings. And I can also work with photographs as well. And this was one particularly nice piece of art in the ice. Um, my camera can be an extra tool when I don't have time to paint to add some inspiration and just the patterns and the textures. And again, in a place where you might look out at this, this image, this landscape, and think, there's nothing there, to go beneath the surface and look a little bit more closely, become an active observer, and see, oh my gosh, there's this really wonderful environment that is really closely tied to culture, to us, to the animals, all intrinsically linked. And so one of my favorite parts of uh, the project was 
meeting a hunter who'd recently harvested a narwhal. And it had this terrific tusk. And I thought, oh my gosh, I really want to paint a narwhal tusk. And so I had to work up the courage to, to, to go ask him if I could borrow it, because he just brought it in, and it was beautiful. And uh, so I had to learn some Greenlandic first. And so I practiced a little bit, and I walked up to him and, and asked, uh, Duva Kalipashinavara? And he kind of looked at me and laughed and nodded. And I, I walked back to our little um, base camp house. And about a couple hours later, he showed up with this enormous tusk that uh, I completed a painting of. Uh, it was a full seven feet long. And helped me relate to the scale of these animals as well and in a different way of um, these, these megafauna, these huge animals that thrive in this landscape. <laughs> People have said, how are you going to frame that? And I think I'm going to do three separate frames and put it next to each other. I, I wanted to put a slide for you with a long, skinny one, but it uh, doesn't reproduce so, uh, quite so well that way. It's a very long panorama. The, part of the time in the settlements, uh, I got to use for outreach and working with the kids, which was really special. Uh, they're extremely active communities when there is ice around the settlements. They can spend time on that playing soccer, running around, taking walks, uh, using the sled dogs. And then there's school where uh, it can be a refuge for some of the kids from, from small houses to go and have a, a space to, to work. Some of the landscape around the settlements. And one group we worked with, uh, Kristen's mentioned Niaurnet, in another town we visited, there were 100 total school children that I met with over a period of four days and gave them a presentation and art workshops. And one thing I asked these kids is I said, hey, can you think about your sense of place? What's home to you? Because home is really personal to all of us. And here in the Pacific Northwest, I think we all relate to this glacially carved landscape, the North Cascades, uh, the Puget Sound. We identify strongly with it all, and it's part of our home. And a place like the Arctic can feel remote, can feel isolated in looking at it or imagining it and seeing it on a map. But for these kids, too, it is their home. And a lot of what we've shown you today is in their drawings of the, uh, the mountains, the icebergs, the polar bears, narwhals, and halibut. It's all part of their consumption, their conception of, of their sense of self and, and their home. And as this project develops and continues, we'll be working with some other um, school groups around this region to, to help build that sense of place, of, of what is your home, and hopefully bringing it all together to expand our sense of our global landscape and our global home. Here's the, uh, one of the, the classes of kids. One thing, a little side note about Greenland is they have some of the highest per capita um, production of music albums. So there's a lot of rock bands. And so these kids were running around with guitars and uh, doing a lot of music up there, which is a, a nice, lively side of things to see. So this work and others, there's uh, some stories that we're not getting into today, but are part of what I'm developing, some from polar bears. And again, coming back to, to tools, things I'll be developing in the studio. And so today, you've gotten our first sneak peek. We did our field work in March, spent some time processing, recovering, working on some other projects. And uh, I want to thank you all, because you're our, you're our launch of Imaging the Arctic to the museum and to the community, and is the beginning of um, the, the work being developed more fully. This next winter, we're planning an exhibit uh, with the Nordic Heritage Museum to feature uh, my work, Kristen Science, as well as photographs by Tina Itkonen, uh, a Finnish photographer who, again, is in the Vanishing Ice exhibit. So we're going to be putting these stories more cohesively to show the uh, sea ice environment through the lens of the science, the animals, and some of the people. So I'd really like to thank all of our sponsors and supporters, and thank you all for being here and for hosting our presentation. And uh, I think next we can take some questions. Mm. Oh. Yeah. 
Uh, she's up here. I can just repeat the question. The question was, have you eaten a narwhal? And the answer is yes, many different ways. <laughs> it does not taste like chicken. It, it doesn't taste like really anything I can describe. <laughs> is diving a part of your research? Is it possible to have divers go down in the water? Um, diving isn't a part of our work, no. I mean, it, you have to be an extremely skilled diver to dive in the sea ice. You can be standing at those leads and within a half an hour they close off completely. So um, there's really not, for us, a lot of information we can gain from a diver in the water. They're also, because narwhals are so skittish, you would, you know, you would need a rebreather and it would become pretty complicated. But so, so for what we do, we don't use divers. No. Uh, thank you for the talk. And uh, the, uh, you had teams of people there that, uh, your, your team, for example, was uh, Norwegians and Danish and are there other teams there from just you know, separate countries like China and Japan and Norway and Denmark, Sweden, or is it more just teams of various um, countries? Um, so our team, there, there are no other teams there. Um, there you know, to be honest, there aren't, there aren't that many kind of studies of narwhals. They're, they're a little bit, uh, maybe not the most popular whale to study, but um, uh, no, so we were the only team, and that team was really compiled by, you know, just reaching out to colleagues and, and experts and people that could really contribute, and it did happen to turn into a very international team. Our, our pilot was Norwegian, our acoustician was German, another acoustician was Icelandic, you know, my tagging technician was, was uh, Danish, and then, you know, I'm, I'm an American, and, and Maria, too, so, yeah. Um, from other sources, I can understand the effect of diminishing ice on the polar bear since it needs to walk. How does the diminishing ice affect a narwhal, which is not using the ice to navigate? Yeah, so that's a very good question. And, and you know, th to be honest, like uh, kind of large scale, that is really the focus of, of this is a, a, one example of a study of a number of the studies we do on narwhals. The question is, how is the, the changing Arctic, the loss of ice, the changes in the ecosystem, how will they affect the species? The, the, the answer is that we don't really know. Um, my, you know, narwhals are different from polar bears. They don't walk around on the ice. They don't need to walk around on the ice to, to catch a seal or find food. They swim between the ice. Um, but, but as we lose ice in the Arctic, we, we're, we're seeing very big ecosystem changes. So that means it's not just the ice going away, but we see differences in water temperatures, changes in currents, changes in the fish species that are present. You know, that affects kind of the whole system. Um, and so, our, you know, our, our hypothesis is really for narwhals, that's probably where we'll, we'll see the impacts. They're very difficult to, to capture scientifically because it's so complicated and there's so many, you know, links. But, but largely it will be through changes in the ecosystem, changes to their prey, changes to where they go to find food, you know, and, and rely on those areas and, and they, may, they may very well change. Is there changes in salinity? Um, are there changes in salinity in the Arctic? You know, it's not, there are in some areas, yeah. It's, it's definitely becoming more fresh. Mm -hmm. But I, it's, you know, I, it's not my expertise, so. This is the halibut, the only, <clears throat> excuse me, is the halibut the only fish species that you found or that they find when they do the stomach no. content analysis? No, so, so when they're making these, ex these dives, I mean, when a, when a whale spends 30 minutes diving to the bottom of the sea, you know that it's sort of a, a very directed behavior and they're going down there for those halibut because that's pretty much what, what's, that's pretty much what there is to eat, and that's what we find in the stomachs in winter. But narwhals eat a, a couple of other species. They feed on cod, arctic cod, polar cod. Um, we know they feed on uh, shrimp and small squid. So when we, when we look at narwhal stomachs in other seasons and from other times of the year, we definitely find other prey species. Yeah. That there's someone there. What about the, the additional shipping and Arctic exploration for minerals and oil? Is, is that, do you anticipate that to affect the population? Yeah, so that's kind of part of this study. There, there are in, on both, coasts, uh, both sides of Greenland, there's huge interest by many oil companies in offshore exploration for oil resources. And so what offshore exploration starts with is seismic exploration, so she showed basically you know, to summarize, just making a lot of very loud sounds underwater to see what's down, you know, below this, below the, the, the bottom. And um, yeah, that is expected to have an impact. These whales use sound to navigate, they use sound to find food, they use sound to communicate. And so 
Um, we know very little about how they use sound and, and even what sounds they make. So for this study, we're really kind of collecting a baseline of information on, on how sound is used by narwhals and hopefully can use that to predict how, what those impacts might be. But they are expected to be, mm -hmm, to, be uh, to occur. So that, yeah. That's a, that's a great question. Yeah, so where am I headed next with work in my studio? What kind of work do I do? And I want to invite you to visit the Vanishing Ice Show, which has some examples of studio paintings of mine, as well as my website or our project website. We have some postcards on the table. But my studio work is really different in where the field component is a chance to try and document, to tell stories, and just absorb as much of the experience as possible. And in the studio, it's more my emotional reaction. And what I react to is the space, the expansiveness, the light, the atmosphere, and these little crisp elements of life that thrive there and that are specialized there, whether the narwhals or the polar bears or um, other projects I've worked with looking at walruses or arctic terns, finding these little elements and highlighting them and trying to create a window to this quiet, this environment, that I find is really special. Uh, one reason I love being in the field on that emotional level is the city is a really stimulating place. There's always input coming in, to-do lists, everything, keeping me really, really busy. And I go up in the mountains or I go to the Arctic and there's this quiet and a chance to just soak up that atmosphere and kind of pay attention to the world and, and kind of get grounded. And that's something I look for in my studio paintings is that sense of quiet and expansiveness outside of this urban bustle when we can get up to these alpine landscapes, these, these um, arctic polar environments. Carrie? Yeah. Um, I have sort of a two-part question. One, um, how do you engage the Greenlandic people in your work in both research and art? Like, what roles do they play on the project teams? And then second, what are you hearing from the Green Greenlandic people about how the changing sea ice is changing their lifestyle and their ability to continue the subsistence living? Yeah. So. Um, so, I mean, I, I've probably been working in Greenland for 14 years, and on almost all of our projects, we have engaged uh, local people in different ways. So, so, you know, in projects where we're flying out on the ice in a helicopter, I have occasionally brought hunters. They often, um, often get sick because <laughs> it's a very, it's a very, uh, very rough ride, so they, they tend not to want to do that. But I have, um, you know, I've had hunters in camps that have been just, like, completely critical to the mission in helping us catch animals, um, spot animals, count animals. Um, I have uh, uh, locals as transla translators. Uh, I have meetings and just get input from people, what they're observing, what they're seeing, what they think about our project. So there's kind of a lot of different ways scientifically that um, local people are engaged. I'll just answer the second part of her question and let you talk about the, the art. Um, so then you, um, no, you asked me, yeah, what, yeah, what we're hearing from them, I, you know, the, the, without a doubt, they observe huge changes in, in their environment. I mean, you know, almost all of the hunters I talk to say, you know, we see changes in the ice, we can't travel where we're used to because it's dangerous for our dog sledges, the glaciers are, are receding to the point there are new islands for them to sail the, their boats around. Um, in terms of animals, they see, you know, changes in condition of polar bears. Um, they see <laughs> new species showing up that they've never seen before, new birds, new, new marine mammals, um, new fish. So, uh, you know, I personally feel like from the conversations I've had that, that it's very clear, they're very clear about their environment changing. You know, when we were, we're sitting here in, in Niaronet and doing this project and it's March, and March in the Arctic is like the, the, basically the best time to be out on the ice. You should be out on your dog sledge that's sun basically, you know, almost 24 hours a day and the ice should be solid and stable and you can, you know, you can use your dogs and it's just an open sea, you know. And so for a lot of these people, they're waiting for the ice to freeze up. It's coming later and later. The, the duration of time they can hunt on the ice is reduced. It's, it's um, I think it's pretty, pretty apparent. So, but um, I'll let you talk about how we engaged local yeah. people in, in the art. 
And I'll add one little side story to Kristen's observation of what locals are experiencing is I met one artist who'd spent many years in Denmark studying from when he was young growing up in Northwest Greenland before coming home some 30 years later. And he mentioned to me, he said, gosh, you know, I came back and I had on my Levi's and my hat and then saw the landscape. And he said, culture shock. It was total it was culture shock coming home. And I read of a term, solastalgia, which is the sense of being homesick in your own home. Um, and that I read used in context with climate change. And that's something I thought of before and thinking back to his words of culture shock, feeling uh, that, that sense of, of homesick for, for what you remember as your home. Um, and it, the, what I've encountered as an artist in Greenland has been really open. Um, one in, in helping to, um, connecting on a personal level of giving people the, the to, some tools I, I really believe in this art toolkit idea, tools for observation, getting out and exploring and paying attention. And on a level, especially with kids, that's really fun. On a personal artist level as well, working or meeting um, adults, it's one way to, to communicate and bridge a language barrier of showing them sketches and a sense of uh, my perspective of, of their home. And living in this community where I, I had a residency too on a previous trip to Greenland, um, where they, they really encourage exhibitions and bringing in foreign ideas, I think, bringing in, they're really open to, to learning more about the rest of the world and also helping to share their home with all of us. Um, so that's something I, I've seen really open and we'll see with Imaging the Arctic if we have the opportunity to, um, to bring more of the, the completed story back. Uh, one thing with Niaornet, we are, I am Facebook friends with some of them, which is a fun way to stay in touch. There's also a really wonderful documentary called Village at the End of the World, which was uh, created a couple years ago by, um, based on Niaornet, telling the story of them um, um, building a community fish factory. That's really a wonderful documentary. You can find their trailer online, Village at the End of the World. I was really curious about the polar bear dentistry. Um, <laughs> how do you do that? Yeah, so one big part, I mean, uh, one component that we basically skipped over for the sake of time was that um, uh, other part, another project that I work on is, is on polar bears in, in, in Greenland and studying populations of bears and how they're doing. And so we, uh, we have a project where we, we capture polar bears. So we fly out in the helicopter and we, um, dart them so they're sedated and then we'll land and then we're able to work on the bear and, and take measurements and look at its condition and, and um, kind of um, take a bunch of samples to tell us how these bears are doing. And so one of the things that we do is polar bears have what's a vestigial premolar. So what that means is it's a very, very small tooth that basically they don't use and it's kind of just right in the front of their um, their big canine tooth, the one that you stay away from. And uh, we can extract that tooth pretty quickly and uh, that tooth we can, we can slice it and just like the rings on a tree we can age the polar bear. So uh, we take the tooth back in the lab and, and slice it to look under the microscope and we can figure out how old the bear is. And that's very important for us when we're looking at conditions of bears to be able to know the age of the animal and, and relate that to its condition. So, so the dentistry part is um, one colleague takes a really big, really thick stick and sticks it in the mouth of the polar bear. So if, if the polar bear decides to close its jaws, it's not while your hands are in there. And then usually me it goes in and, and extracts the tooth very quickly. So, yeah. Upstairs. Uh, yeah. Hi, I had a question about the bio contaminants or pollutants that you found in some of the um, species there. And I wondered what compounds specifically are found in narwhals or if you've looked at that. Yeah, so um, I, don't, I don't specifically study um, pollution or, or pollution loads in marine mammals, but I mean, very roughly, I can say um, there are a lot of heavy metals that are found in these, um, in these species. There are PCBs. Um, there's kind of a, a very wide range of different compounds and, 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 and sort of pollutants that are found in the tissues that, um, that t seem to be increasing. But uh, you know that's just very coarsely what what people have found. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can tell me this or not, but what in the tooth indicates the age? Um, uh, the question was, what in the tooth indicates the age? Um, so mammalian teeth 
uh, your teeth too have, uh, you have a, an enamel layer and then you have dentin, so that's kind of the, the main part of your teeth, and then you have something called cementum, and that's where your roots are, and that kind of anchors your, your tooth in your gum. And uh, as you age, you basically lay down layers. You know, the, you basically you, um, you lay down layers in both the dentin and the cementum, so in both parts of that teeth, and those layers can be counted. Does that make sense? Yeah. This is a lab man, a dental lab man sitting over here, and I'm a dentist, and I have never seen that. I've extracted hundreds of teeth. Have you thin sectioned them and, and looked at them under a microscope? Yeah. Yeah, it's done widely with, with many, many wildlife species. They, we thin section teeth, I mean, not just polar bears, but seals and canids and all kinds of species. That's how you can age them, yeah. You can also age um, animals through the eye lens, so that's another technique. You wouldn't want to do that on a live polar bear, but if you have a, a dead animal, you can look at the aspartic acid in the, in the eye lens, and the, that changes over the course of the animal's life. So there are different methods. Hey, as we're on the subject of their teeth, and the um, tusk. His tusk. Do they know why that spirals? Do, do they know why it spirals? Yeah, why it spirals. Why, grow, why does it grow like not that? Not really. It's the only, you know, not really. I mean, nobody's explained why it spirals. It always spirals to the left, too. But uh, <laughs> I don't know the answer why. Yeah. Yeah, what was your communication means with the rest of the world? And what did the villages have for communication with the outside world? Oh, okay. The question is, what, what was our communication means when we were in the field? We were pretty, in Greenland, we were pretty wired. So Greenlanders have loved their mobile phones. So in almost every community, if you have a cell phone, you have cell service. And so, um, you know, we had, we had a landline phone, and if you have a mobile phone, we, we were able to communicate that way. And then we also, in our field station where we were staying, had access to the internet. So we were able to check weather and check ice conditions and things like that. So I would say, you know, I've been on projects where I'm in a tent and there's a satellite phone and that's it. But this was a pretty, pretty sophisticated project. You could post things on your website and update blogs. And it wasn't, it wasn't that isolated. When you mentioned checking the ice, is there some satellite photo current time website you go? How, how do you know in terms of flying out what the ice is doing and where do you find that? Yeah, there are, um, there are agencies that post, uh, there are satellites flying over the Arctic, of course, many times per day and those capture images. And so there are images that are posted usually twice a day in the morning and the afternoon. And so you can kind of get a general picture of what the ice looks like by going to one of these, these um, uh, websites and, and looking at the ice. That doesn't necessarily tell you that it's ice you can work with. So that the, kind of the, the next level of is, can I land a helicopter? Are there narwhals in this ice? Is really ice that you have to fly out and check. Mm -hmm. So we can kind of look and see where the ice is. Are there a lot of clouds? Does it look pretty good? And then kind of say, okay, let's try, and pack up the helicopter and go out. But you might go out and end up with really, really lousy, unsafe ice that you wouldn't want to land on and have to go home. So it's, the satellite images only tell you so much about the conditions. Okay, and then two other related questions is, how thick is that ice generally that you're landing on, and what's the air temperature often, say, in that spring time of year? It, the ice that we land on ranges, it can be, you know, a, 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 it's usually a couple of feet thick, I would say, at least three, you know, three to, three to six feet thick. Um, the, uh, and you said, what were the, the air, air temperature? temperature. Um, I would say, for the most part, now I, I do everything in Celsius, I have to convert. It was, it was um, probably about min minus 15 and minus 20 Celsius, so somebody do Fahrenheit. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question up here. These whales are diving up to a mile deep for their food. Mm -hmm. How do they locate their food when they reach the depths? Is it an echoing system? Yeah, uh, you know, the way, they, the way they see underwater is with sound, so that's why sound is so important. So they have, um, they have a, a, an echolocation system where they basically send out clicks and those clicks bounce off of objects and they receive those clicks and they can kind of detect things. So we, we think they can detect movement, they can detect objects. So very likely when they're down there at those depths, they're using that sound to see the prey. You know, more specifically how they actually 
you know, catch the fish or, or, or we have no idea. We probably never will know, but, uh, but you know, in general, they use sound to find, find them. This is a question for uh, Maria. Uh, one of the things I noticed um, this time compared to um, up my other exposure to your art is that you use more motion, such as time-lapse photography and video. And I'm just kind of curious about that, using that as an educational tool with the children you work with or other people you're doing education with. Do you anticipate using more of that in the future? One thing I've really enjoyed using audio is um, helping to bring in some of the atmosphere. And this trip was my first time playing with some of the time lapse. That was, um, we had a little GoPro to play with, so it was really, really fun. And one thing I, I do with kids a lot that I suppose the next presentation we could do together and when I'm presenting solely is I do virtual expeditions to Greenland where I provide a whole group of kids with little journals, that's their expedition journal, and then we go on an expedition together. And so part of the fun is getting to sit with little kids holding their ears, taking off in the helicopter and landing and coming out and starting to sketch what they see. And the end result is a really wonderful set of sketches with notes and for me, it helps bring them into that role of being active observers and teaching to, to um, look at things more closely and seeing these shapes. So that, that's one thing that I really use these pieces for. And, and with Kristen, it's a fun opportunity to help put together some of these little vignettes that we can show um, online, that, we can, um, that she can use as a tool in her work and in other, other events we do. So I see them as a little extra tool, whether with just the paintings or just the sketches. Um, but uh, I came back with, um, Oh gosh, over 50 or 60 little sketches that, again, now I'm, I'm in the process of, of doing the studio work for more. So, so come back again for the, uh, the studio perspective. Well, I want to thank you both for being here. It's been very engaging and interesting. Thanks so much. Thank you.